Welcome back to Bargaining 101. I'm William Spaniel, and this lecture is on the first offer advantage we see in the Rubenstein bargaining model. That, of course, is the subject of Chapter 10 of Game Theory 101 Bargaining, and you can check the video description for more information about that. Now, last time we analyzed why the Rubenstein outcome is what it is. So in this alternating offers infinite horizon game, we see Albert offering delta divided by one plus delta in the first period, we see Barbara accepting that, and we see the game immediately ending. So the previous lecture is why that's the case. This lecture is the what. What's going on here, and how do the players actually internalize the outcome of this game? Well, the critical thing is that the proposer in the first stage, the guy who has the first offer, is going to be doing better than the person who has the second offer. And we see this by actually looking at what the payoffs are in the game. Barbara's payoff is very easy to calculate. She's accepting an offer of delta divided by 1 plus delta, so we know that that is her payoff. Albert, meanwhile, is getting everything that Barbara does not receive. The total value of the good is 1, so if you take 1 minus Barbara's share, that is going to be equal to what you see in the first bullet point, 1 divided by 1 plus delta, which is Albert's share of the good when they play the Rubenstein bargaining game. Now, if you remember back to when I introduced the discount factor to you, the discount factor is a number between 0 and 1 to reflect the fact that the future isn't as valuable as today, but it's still worth something. So for example, if delta is equal to one half, if you substitute delta equal to one half, then you get these payoffs. Albert's share of the surplus is two thirds, and Barbara's is only one third. So Albert is doing twice as well here as Barbara is. Now, this isn't as extreme as was the case in the ultimatum game, where Albert was receiving all of the surplus and Barbara was receiving none of it. But nevertheless, Albert is still doing better than Barbara here. And this is not just for the delta equal to one half, this is for any delta at all. Because delta is between zero and one, if you compare those two payoffs, the first proposer, the guy who is making the first offer in the first period, is always going to be getting more than the person receiving the first offer, and the person who would only have an offer in the second stage that the person would have to reject the first offer to be able to make a proposal of his or her own. And this actually makes sense if you think back to what we know about bargaining theory. We know that proposal power is a huge form of bargaining power. And by virtue of the fact that even in a situation where we're going back and forth making offers, the person who makes the first offer has slightly more proposal power than the other side. And because time is costly here, because if we delay an agreement from one period to the next, that the discount factor is going to eat up some of the value of such an agreement, the person making the first proposal can take advantage of this fact and demand a little bit more for his or herself and thereby allow his or herself to receive more of the good than the receiver of the first offer. Nevertheless, despite the fact that the first offer gives an advantage to the first proposer, we often think of the Rubenstein bargaining model as having a fair solution. And here's why. As delta goes to 1, the payoffs become more and more equitable, and they finally become, in fact, equal to each other at exactly 1. And you can see this by looking at the payoff pair. So that second bullet point is the first proposer's amount, and the second part of that one is the second proposer's amount. And we see that if you substitute delta equal to 1, both of those values become 1 half, 1 half. And moreover, we often tend to think of common bargaining situations as having very large discount factors, essentially very close to one. And the reason we think that is because in any situation where you can make an offer very quickly to each other, then the cost in terms of time of going from one stage to the next stage by having that time factor in through a rejection of the initial offer, it becomes more and more irrelevant, increasingly irrelevant as you get quicker and quicker offers. So for example, in a flea market setting, you're able to go through, what, 10, 20 offers, uh, counter offers with each other in a single minute. 
So having the single rejection in the first stage is only going to cost you a few seconds worth of time. And while yes, time is valuable, three seconds is not particularly valuable. And so in these sorts of situations where we're able to make offers back and forth to each other very quickly, that's like saying that the discount factor is very close to one. So despite the fact that the proposer in the first stage has a first offer advantage, that first offer advantage becomes increasingly fleeting as the discount factor goes to one, or alternatively, as we're able to make offers very, very quickly to each other. So this is the first advantage off, uh, first advantage for you in the Rubenstein bargaining game. It's always going to be there, but depending on the discount factor, it may in fact be very small, and so the Rubenstein bargaining game might actually have a very equitable solution, especially compared to a game like, say, the Ultimatum game. So I hope you enjoyed this, and I hope to see you next time. Take care.